dear student welcome to this course on analytical technologies in biotechnology it is quite evident that advances in technology has been vital in the progress of science in life sciences advances in analytical techniques have played a crucial role in understanding of biological functions at the molecular and cellular level biotechnology is an interdisciplinary science that involves the application of chemical and physical techniques in the field of life sciences the recent progress in the field of biology has been made possible by the application of many chemical techniques as well as the principles of physics that have helped unravel many mysteries of biology now let's understand this let's take some examples to understand the crucial role of technology in biotechnology now cell is the basic unit of life and biology started with the discovery of cell now a cell is so small that it cannot be seen with unaided eyes the cellular world was unknown and unseen till a dutchman named anton van leeuwenhoek for the first time observed a tiny cell with simple glass lens later advances in the field of microscopy led to the detailed study of cells subcellular organelles microorganisms macromolecular assemblies and so on with radioisotope and later fluorescence labeling a biomolecule could be traced localized and relative distribution as a function of time could be analyzed through various advanced microscopy techniques new advances like confocal microscopy has enabled three dimensional observation of whole cell or a thick specimen likewise the field of molecular biology was born with the double helix model of watson and crick till 1940 it was hard to accept dna as genetic material but with the watson and crick model where a part of the data from x-ray diffraction analysis was used to unravel this structure this model uh, could provide convincing explanation for how genetic information is uh, stored retrieved and translated in a living organism now new advanced techniques for analyzing dna rna and proteins have come up modern recombinant dna technology allows an individual gene or a segment of dna to be cloned sequenced and expressed in specific systems technique known as polymerase chain reaction has allowed the selective amplification of specific segments of dna for further use the technique is being used extensively in the field of molecular biology medical science and forensic science uh, recently advanced automated dna sequencing methods have facilitated the determination of complete genome sequences of many organisms including human gibraphis rice arabidopsis and so on now these genomic sequences or information is being uh, uh, unraveling the ev every day that will allow new insights into the field of science many powerful uh, analytical techniques have been are being used for isolation and characterization of proteins these include chromatography electrophoresis centrifugation and spectroscopy techniques now chromatography methods could be used for purification of proteins to homogeneity on the basis of charge size hydrophobicity and affinity molecular weight and subunit composition of proteins at very low concentration can be analyzed and uh, this electrophoresis method could be used for this purpose two dimensional gel electrophoresis could be used for resolving large amount of or large mixture of proteins which can be further analyzed by mass spectrometry ultra centrifugation could be used for separating various cell components 
on the basis of size and density. Now, also sedimentation behavior of purified biomolecules could be derived or determined by an analytical ultrasound fuse. Novel techniques in the field of spectroscopy have led to the understanding of interaction between matter and radiation and facilitated the characterization of biomolecules. Many of these techniques have come up, they include UV, visible, IR, FTIR, spectroscopy. Three dimensional structure of proteins and DNA are being determined at atomic resolution using X-ray crystallography and NMR. For X-ray crystallography, purified protein or material needs to be crystallized, where structure of protein in solution can be determined by NMR. The 3 D structures are key for understanding uh, structure function relationship and hence the immensely they have immensely helped in the field of drug designing uh, uh, against specific targets. For example, methotrexate is used in anti cancer drugs. A very sensitive new technique called mass spectrometry allows precise determination of mass of intact protein and derive peptides from them and it is being widely used in proteomics. Uh, many new advances in science seems to be out of science fiction and enabling a complete view of life. This course will focus on theory and practical applications of some of the important analytical techniques used in different areas of biotechnology. We will be trying to cover most of the top, uh, most of the uh, content, but not all. Now, all the illustrations used in this course are schematic diagrams and should be remembered that they has been uh, used only for understanding the concepts. The course outline here, the topics which are going to be covered in this course are as follows. Number one, microscopy. In microscopy, we are going to cover basic concepts in microscopy, then specific techniques like dark field, phase contrast, fluorescence, confocal, polarization microscopy in light microscopy and then in electron microscopy, transmission and scanning electron microscopy techniques. Radioisotope techniques will cover basic concepts, the Geiger Muller and scintillation counters, autoradiography, radio immunoassay and applications in biological sciences. Also, the safety issues will be discussed. In chromatography methods, the general principles and basic concepts, then specific techniques, ion exchange, gel filtration, affinity and gas chromatography techniques will be discussed. In electrophoresis, the basic principles and different types of electrophoresis techniques uh, like isoelectric focusing, STS page, 2D, pulse field and immunoelectrophoresis will be discussed. In centrifugation techniques, basic principles, different types of centrifuges, analytical and preparative ultra centrifugation methods will be discussed. Then in spectroscopic techniques, we uh, will be dealing with basic concepts, then UV visible, fluorescence, CD, NMR, X-ray and atomic absorption and flame emission spectroscopy. Also here mass spectrometry will be discussed. Other techniques which are going to be discussed, which are advanced techniques are polymerase chain reaction, advanced DNA sequencing methods and ELISA. So, we will start with our first topic that is microscopy. Now, I think all of you must have used a very simple lens for magnifying a particular object. Now, microscopy is the science where microscopes are used for viewing objects that are not visible to the unaided eye. In other terms, that objects are too small to be seen by unaided eyes. The word microscopy comes from Greek roots where micros means small 
and scopio means to view. So, microscopy means to view small objects. A microscope is an optical instrument that uses a lens or a combination of lens to produce a magnified image of an object too small to be seen with the naked eye. Now, there are three branches of microscopy. These are optical or light microscopy, electron microscopy and scanning probe microscopy. Now, the first two microscopic techniques that is light and electron microscopy involves various phenomena like refraction, reflection and diffraction of electromagnetic radiation or electron beams to generate an image. Whereas, scanning probe microscopy the third one for example, atomic force microscopy involves the interaction of a scanning probe with the surface of an object. Now, the first let us little bit uh, get the glimpse of the history in a in very brief of the microscopy. The first microscope to be developed was optical microscope. The first detailed account for the of the interior construction of living tissue based on the use of microscope did not appear until 1644. The greatest contribution came from Antony van Leeuwenhoek in year 1676, who for the first time discovered the microorganisms using his simple lens. Now, before uh, this Robert Hooke described the compound microscope in, in his book Micrographia published in 1665 and the most famous microscopic observation was his study of thin slices of cork. Later on after much uh, late Ernst Ebb together with Carl Jais in 1877 almost like 200 years defined the physical law that determined resolving distance of an objective which is objective lens we should say and that is known as Epps law. In 1893 August Kohler developed a key technique for simple illumination uh, or we can say sample illumination called Kohler illumination which is central to modern light microscopy. Now, development of first transmission electron microscope was started by Ernst Ruska in 1931 which was followed by the development of scanning electron microscope in 1935 by Max Noll, where he got first scanning electron microscopy images and later by Manfred von Ardine in 1937 who did pioneering work on physical principles of scanning electron microscope and the beam specimen interactions. In 1953 to 55 Fritz Jarnik and George Namarski contributed towards the development of phase contrast and differential interference contrast illumination, which allowed imaging of transparent samples. The 1980s saw the development of first scanning probe microscope and from then lot of advancement has taken place in the field of microscopy. Now, let us start with the microscopy and let us discuss some of the terms which are related to microscopy. The first term we are going to discuss is absorption. I think everybody understand about absorption. When the light passes through any object, the intensity is reduced depending upon the color absorbed and thus the selective absor absorption of white light pr produces a colored light. So, any time a light passes through certain object or a specimen there is certain absorption takes place which reduces the intensity of the transmitted light. Then second term is refraction. I think refraction is the turning or bending of any wave such as light or sound wave when it passes from one medium into another medium of different optical density or refractive index. Like here shown when light passes from air to glass and back into air there is the bending of light and you can see the angle of incidence 
and angle of refractions are different. I think everybody must have seen this phenomenon when they have seen objects dipped in water. Uh, third uh, term is diffraction. Now, diffraction is the change in the direction and intensities of a group of waves after passing by an obstacle or through an aperture whose size is approximately the same as the wavelength of the wave. Now, for in sim simple terms, light rays bend around edges or apertures and the new wave fronts are generated at sharp edges. So, diffraction is an important term with relation to resolution as we will discuss later on. Next term is dispersion. Dispersion is a phenomenon in which separation of light into its constituent wavelength occurs when entering a transparent medium. For example, white light consists, consists of more than one wavelength and they will be separated or they will be distributed when they pass through a prism or certain other medium. Next term very important magnification as we use lens or microscopes for magnification. Now, magnification is the process of enlarging an object only in appearance and not in physical size. So, when we are looking at the magnified image, it appears to be large and it is not really large as such. Next term is interference. Now, interference is the variation of wave amplitude that occurs when waves of the same or different frequency come together. There could be constructive interference or there could be destructive interference. I think we will discuss these this in detail later on. The next very important term is resolution or resolving power of a lens. Now, resolving power is defined as the distance separating two points objects within the specimen that can just be distinguished from one another in the image. This is also referred to as minimum resolvable distance. That is, if you can distinguish two objects separated by a particular distance, that will be called the resolving power or minimum resolvable distance. These were few terms which required a mention here. Let us get into the theory of image formation by a lens and this is important in microscopy. Let us understand this. Now, theory of image formation by lens can be defined or discussed in terms of either geometric optics or physical optics. Let us now geometric optics explains primarily focus and aberrations, whereas physical optics explains image formation in terms of contrast and other things and resolution. Let us take both of these things one by one. Let us first discuss geometric optics. The two rule of geometric optics are that light travels in the straight path, that is the first rule. The second rule is that path bends or the light path bends or we can say refracts as we have discussed earlier at an interface between the two transparent media. Now, where you can see the uh, relationship between the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction can be given by or explained by the Snell's law, where sin i upon sin r equals n 2 upon n 1. Now, n 2 and n 1 are refractive indices of the medium and i and r are the angles of incidence and refraction. The refractive index is defined as the ratio of the speed of light through air or vacuum divided by the speed of light through object. So, this Snell's law explains the relationship between the angle of incidence and angle of refraction as light passes from one medium into the other. Now, let us see how the image formation takes place uh, by the lens. Now, here what we have shown is a convex lens. Now, lenses called could be of two types mainly. One is converging lens which is convex 
or double convex lens and other is diverging lens or concave or double concave lens. Now, let us first discuss about the converging lens, then we will see the diverging lens. Converging lens are thinner at the edges and thicker at the center. As you can see here, the converging lens, uh, the surface here both is convex on both sides. Now, this could be various combinations can be uh, put in here, which could be plano convex or plano concave and other combination can come in. Now, let us discuss in detail this figure here. Uh, if you see here, there are few things which needs to be seen. One is that focal length. Now, this lens is a biconvex or double convex lens and this lens here will converge the light rays which are falling parallel to it. Now, the f or focal point is the point where the lens will focus all the light which are falling par uh, parallel rays which are falling on it. Now, the length from the lens to the point where the light is focused is called the focal length and the plane at the uh, focus focal point is called focal plane. Now, there are other things to be seen that if you see here object has been placed beyond one focal length and you can see that an image is being formed which is inverted image that is upside down. Now, on the left object is placed and the distance where, where uh, distance between the lens and the point where object is placed called object distance and the ob where object is placed is called the object plane. Likewise, on the right side the place where image is being formed is called image plane and the distance between the lens that the center of the lens to the point where image is being formed is called image distance. Now, uh, as we will see later on the relationship between the position of the object and the image formation, but here what we see is that a converging lens forms a real inverted image on the opposite side of the lens that is your object is on the left side and the image is being formed on the other side. Now, when we say it is a real image, it means that the rays or light rays are converging at that point. For example, if you put a piece of paper or a screen, the image could be seen there, could be uh, recorded there. Uh, so, that is what a real image is. Inverted means, if you can see that arrow has been inverted, that is it is upside down and that is what inverted image is called. And this image has been formed when you have placed the object beyond a single focal length and we will see how the relationship is between the object position and the image. Now, this whole thing could be explained or you can say the image distance, object distance and focal length can be related uh, by a simple Gaussian form of lens equation, which is 1 upon O plus 1 upon I equals 1 upon F, where O is object distance, I is image distance and F is focal length of the lens. Linear magnification, which is the magnification obtained is given by the either by i upon o. Now, here i will be negative and negative sign indicates that an inverted image is being formed. So, and or it can be given by the height of the image to the height of the uh, ratio of the height of the image to the height of the object that can also be used for determining the magnification. Now, let us little bit, uh, we will be discussing more of the converging lens, but let us see how the image formation takes place in a concave lens or diverging lens. As you can see here, like I said, the concave or diverging lenses are thicker at the edges and the thinner at the center. Now, interestingly here, the rays seems to be diverging rather than converging. As you can see here that the object wherever you place uh, 
uh, on the left hand side of the lens, it always forms a reduced and erect, erect and virtual image, virtual image because it does not form a real image and the virtual image is formed on the same side of the lens where uh, on the side where the object is placed. As you can see this object is placed and image is also being formed on the left hand side. Now, here both f and i are negative quantities in lens equation, because image distance is on the left hand side and the focal point in terms of that if you draw backwards the diverging rays from the lens, it will focus, it will come to the focus and that is why the f and i are negative quantities in the lens equation. Now, let us little bit go into as we are discussing the focus here, let us little bit do go into the relationship between the image formed by double convex lens in terms of the position of that particular object. Now, first situation could be or first option could be that object is placed at infinity. Now, when object is placed at infinity, then parallel rays of light uh, will hit the lens or will fall on the lens. Now, if you could recall the parallel rays of light when they are focused on to the lens or then they, they fall on to the lens, they are focused on the focal point. That is what the, the focal point is because the lens focuses these right, uh, light uh, rays on that point. So, if object is placed at infinity, then the image will be formed at the focal point that is principal focal point. Now, let us bring the object little closer. When you bring the object beyond 2 f, then the image is formed which is inverted, diminished and real image is formed between the 2 f and f, where 2 f is 2 focal lengths and f is 1 focal length. So, as you can see as you have brought the object closer to the lens that is beyond 2 focal lengths, then the image is being formed between f and 2 f and it is a inverted diminished and real. Diminished means of a smaller size that is the size of the object is bigger than the size of the image. The third uh, scenario can be that as you bring the object much closer between 2 f and f that is between 2 focal uh, lengths and 1 focal length, then a real inverted and enlarged image is formed. Remember last time it was reduced image or diminished image was formed, here it is a enlarged image. Now, enlarged image is formed beyond 2 f. So, as you are bringing the object closer, then the image is being formed at the farthest point on the other side of the lens. So, in case where you have put the object between f and 2 f, the image is being formed farther from 2 focal lens and it is inverted real and it is enlarged, it is magnified image as we can say. Now, if you bring it further closer like at focal point, then what happens is that image is essentially not formed or we can say image will be formed, but at infinity because as the rays leave the lens, they are the parallel, parallel rays which are focused at infinity. So, this will be scenario if object is placed at uh, focal point. Now, the last scenario is that you can bring the object further closer to the lens that is before the focal point or less than one focal length. Now, in this situation what will happen is that rather than a real image is being formed, a virtual upright and, and enlarged image will be formed. And as we say virtual image, then this image is formed on the same side of the lens as the object is placed. So, if the object is placed at a distance shorter than focal length, then virtual upright image is formed, it is not inverted. And remember the when we see magnification negative i upon o, here that negative negative will become positive. So, uh, that is the difference here indicating that it is a upright image. So, what we have seen in here is if you see 
if we have to infer from here that as the object is farther from the lens, the image is formed closer to the lens on the other side. But as you bring the object very close to the lens, the image is formed at the farthest end or far uh, uh, much further from the lens on the image plane side or on the right hand side. Now, if you bring the uh, object too close, then a virtual image is formed which is upright. So, that is the uh, main point here which needs to be considered. Now, this we have discussed is one part that is focus and how image is formed when object is placed at different places on the left hand side of the lens or one side of the lens. Now, let us go into the other part of geometric optics that is aberrations. Now, aberrations are when lenses fail to bring the rays or all rays from a given point on an object to a unique focus that is called aberrations. Now, when there is an aberration, then blurred or uh, not so clear images are formed, because all rays uh, are not focused at the same point and you do not get sharp image. There are two main types of aberrations here, one is called chromatic aberration and another is called spherical aberration. Let us see what are the two kinds of aberrations. Now, chromatic aberration is occurs because index of refraction of any substance depends upon the wavelength and the position of focal point is dependent on wavelengths. So, what happens is that supposing a white light containing different wavelengths is focused on the lens, then they will be focused at different points, they will not be focused at the same point. Like for example, blue light will be focused closer to the lens, like it will have a smaller focal length as compared to the uh, higher wavelength light, for example, red or green. So, these lights are not focusing at the same point and what you get is a blurred image with different color separation. Now, this chromatic aberration is a kind of problem, but it has been corrected by using a lens system consisting of several types of glasses or lenses for which the relationship between the index of refraction uh, and wavelength uh, balances to make, make the refractive index independent of wavelength. So, what you get is you get a clear and sharp image in the corrected lens systems and these are called achromatic or apochromatic lenses. The next aberration is physical aberration or spherical aberration as we call it and it is also called principal point imaging aberration. Uh, uh, now, here it results from the fact that all rays from a single point do not pass through the same unique point or same image point and because of this, because they are passing from different parts of the lens. As you can see here, the rays passing from different parts of lens are being focused at different places like one which are passing from the edges are focused closer as compared to those which are passing through the center. And this is a, a problem with lot of lenses and the spherical aberrations like chromatic aberration also has been corrected by appropriate lens constructions. So, both in advanced microscopes now, both chromatic aberration and spherical aberrations have been corrected and these are called aplanetic lens like achromatic lenses. There is one uh, point imaging aberration I just wanted to show here that is coma because it gives a comet shape um, to the object uh, and uh, in the image plane and the symmetry is almost lost here. So, these were two aberrations which were common, but now in advanced systems these are have been corrected with combination of lens systems. So, this was about geometric optics. Now, let us go into the physical optics. Now, physical optics explains image formation and resolution, the two important things image formation in terms of contrast or sharp images being formed and resolution. Now, here in physical optics light is considered as an electromagnetic radiation, it is a waveform and light is diffracted at edges and apertures and can interfere constructively 
or destructively. Now, when diffraction occurs or when light passes through a specimen, then diffraction occurs, because you can consider that there are edges or there are apertures in there. A lens can also be considered an, as an aperture and can diffract light. So, what happens is, when an illu illuminated point in the object plane, it appears as a circle of light surrounded by a series of bright concentric rings resulting from constructive interference in the image plane. Now, the pattern is defined as an airy disk or airy pattern, airy disk is the central light or disk and the concentric rings total in totality it is airy pattern. Now, resolution is determined by the ability to separate different airy disk patterns arising from each points closely placed. There will be lot of points from where diffraction will occur and each will give its own pattern and or each pattern has to be separated. As we can see here that airy disk in the sense you have uh, airy disk pattern where there is a central bright light, then it is surrounded by concentric rings where light and dark rings which are resultant of destructive and constructive interference. Now, the uh, if you consider here like I was saying, if the two airy disks are, uh, if the two points are too close and their airy disk patterns or diffraction patterns overlap, then you will not be able to distinguish them. But if do these two airy disk patterns, particularly the central light disk can be separated, then the two point objects can be resolved. And this could be seen here that in the first case, the you can see only one airy disk, which is it is you can see one circle, because the both patterns are superimposed and the two point objects cannot be uh, resolved. In second one, there are partly overlapping and since the two patterns are partly overlapping, uh, it is not completely resolved. In third case, you can see that two point objects are completely resolved as their airy patterns or airy disk central bright disk is only partly overlapping. So, uh, to uh, get uh, resolution or to see two point objects as a separate entities, these two uh, diffraction patterns has to be resolved. And this has defined the resolution in terms that radius of the first dark ring surrounding the central disk has been calculated to be 0 0.61 lambda upon n sin u, which is defined as resolution. We can see it in detail here that resolution limit or minimum distance that two points in an object must be separated to resolve is given by d, which is the minimum distance which could be resolved by 0 0.61 lambda upon n sin u. Now, here the minimum distance or d which could be resolved is limited by the wavelength. So, you, if you see lambda is the wavelength, u is the angle uh, made by the lens and uh, at axial object and it is the half the angle you can say of the total cone of light. You can say uh, as of aperture or one half of angle of light entering the lens here. Then n is the index of refraction of an on object side of the lens. Now, most of the time you will have uh, air as the uh, as the medium and n will be the index of refraction of the air, but there could be lenses where you could have uh, oil immersed lenses or water immersed lenses as we will see. Now, resolution can be increased by decreasing wavelength like here one has to understand the as d decreases, we say resolution is increasing. So, d has to decrease in order to increase the resolution. So, if you decrease the wavelength, d will decrease and hence the resolution will increase, increasing n that is refractive index. So, when you have oil immersed lenses, the refractive index is higher and you can get better resolution and increasing u. As you bring the lens closer to the object, the u will increase and that will certainly increase the amount of light 
gathered and that will certainly increase and therefore, it will increase the uh, resolution obtained. Now, the denominator that is n sin u is called numerical aperture. Now, uh, this in optics as we say numerical aperture uh, of an optical system is a dimensionless number and it characterizes the range of angles over which the system can accept or emit light. N is a constant for each lens and is a measure of its light gathering qualities. The maximum possible numerical aperture for an object designed to be used in air is 1, because refractive index of air is 1. Uh, practically it can be made, uh, it can be up to 0.95, uh, but you can increase that numerical aperture. Like for example, glycerin uh, refractive index is 1.33 uh, and uh, for immersed oil uh, it is 1.51, uh, for water it is 1.33, glycerin it is 1.47 and for immersion oil it is 1.51. Now, for objectives immersed in oil uh, numerical aperture is up to 1.5 and so you can increase the resolution drastically. Uh, the wider the angle the lens is capable of receiving light, uh, uh, the greater will be the resolving power. And how can we understand? This could be understood by simple uh, diffraction uh, uh, term. Now, as the object diffracts the light, then the higher the order of diffraction, that is if two point objects or two points in the specimen are closely placed then they will diffract the light at higher angle rather than the two points which are not so closely placed. So, higher the order of diffraction that is higher the angle of diffraction the more will be the information contained in it and if the lens can collect, uh, collect higher order of diffraction then it can provide higher resolution or you can say the lens has higher resolving power. Now, what is like useful magnification? Like for example, we can use different lenses with different magnification powers, but what is the useful magnification in terms of resolution? Now, here it has been given that useful magnification as has been calculated is approximately 1000 times the N A of the objective lens that is numerical aperture of the objective lens. Beyond this results in empty magnification and the image deteriorates. So, what we have to see is that if you have say objective of 40 x and say other lens that is eyepiece as we will discuss of 5 x or 10 x to a certain label that is if n a is 1 then 1000 times you can uh, 1000 x could be the maximum magnification you can go for getting the maximum details of the specimen, but beyond that point the image uh, will be deteriorated and you will not get any more information. Now, higher N A is achieved by using lens with a short focal length, which allows lens to be placed very close to the specimen and decreasing the wavelength. Now, limit of resolution, if you consider all uh, different uh, things. Uh, so, limit of resolution of light microscopy can be determined by substituting minimum possible wavelength and maximum possible N A. Now, the value obtained with the conventional lenses is about 0.2 micrometer, which is sufficient to resolve large cellular organelles. So, that is the limit of resolution for light microscopy, because you cannot go below a certain wavelength for light microscopy and you could have only you can numerical aperture could reach up to certain uh, place. Uh, for example, in oil immersion lens it could be highest. So, you have if you, uh, if you substitute maximum values for this the uh, resolution will go up to little less than 0.2 micrometer and which is quite good for uh, many uh, cellular experiments or to view many cellular organelles. Uh, if you compare it with the naked eye, 
the numerical aperture of naked eye is 0 0.004, which is and limit of resolution is around 0.1 millimeter. So, you cannot see uh, at the best you can see up to 0 0.1 the uh, objects or the points which are separated by 0 0.1 millimeter. Now, let us uh, go into little bit uh, as we have seen through the physical optics and geometric optics. Let us summarize the two uh, things. In geometric optics, what we are discussing is the focus and aberrations, where you have seen that lens focuses the light on a certain point, which is called principal focal point and the object the image formation takes place in terms of where the object is placed. Other thing was the aberration. Aberration was in that lens fails to focus lights at the, uh, the lights of different wavelengths at the same place or which is a chromatic aberration and the spherical aberration because of the construction of lens or uh, because of the light passing through different parts of the lens is not focused at the same place. Therefore, the, uh, the spherical aberration or point imaging aberration occurs and both has been corrected for the in the advanced microscopes. Resolution is again function of like we have seen that wavelength, the refractive index and the angle at which the light is being collected. So, the n sin u that is numerical aperture is very important here in terms of uh, 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 determining the resolution and terms of light gathering capabilities of a lens. Today, we will stop here. In the next lecture, we will start with the microscope which is compound microscope different parts, we will discuss different parts of compound microscopes and, uh, and the importance of those constituents. Uh, thank you very much.